All right, welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome back Tammy Burdick. She's a patient advocate, and she's the author of the book, Diagnosis Detective, Curing Granulomatosis, Mastitis. Today's Kevin MD article is titled, Medical Gaslighting, A Growing Challenge in Today's Medical Landscape. Tammy, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So I think today's article briefly retells your story. Go to kevinmd.com slash podcast, upper right-hand corner. There's a search icon. You could search for Tammy's name and her last episode. But let's get right into this current article. Why did you decide to write it? Because medical gaslighting has impacted basically my entire family. So I was actually dismissed during my journey with granulomatous mastitis, but My father had a stroke and was in the hospital and they released him without doing the one test that would tell them what was causing it. And so he ended up having to have a procedure, but I had to advocate for him. I had to find a cardiologist. I I knew with everything in me that there was something that was causing it heart related. And then my mom had ongoing headaches. She kept going to her primary care physician a couple of times, was referred to neurology. The neurologist tried to diagnose her with headache syndrome. And I'm like, yeah, that seems a little ridiculous. (laughs) He wasn't even going to do any imaging. And so the imaging that they did found out that she had a brain tumor. Hmm. So then my uncle passed away in May and we're pretty confident that it was neglect in the healthcare system that contributed to his unfortunate and sudden passing of cardiac arrest. So tell us, what's your definition of medical gaslighting? Yeah. So if a patient goes to a doctor and they start feeling like they're not being heard or the doctor's giving them X, Y, Z excuses, or maybe you're just too young or it's all in your head or whatever you're going through, it's going to pass. And then the patient leaves there even more insecure about their circumstances than when they first went to go see the doctor. Now, what separates medical gaslighting from scenarios where simply physicians may not know what's going on? Yeah. So I guess it's kind of a hard question because maybe perhaps the patient would leave feeling confident that the doctor is going to do X, Y, Z test, or at least make the conscious effort to try to figure out what's going on with them. I think more so when there's medical gaslighting going on in particular, that the patient leaves with really out any answers or no testing, or there's not going to be some sort of process involved to try to help the patient. So as you introduce this article, you talked about various scenarios where medical gaslighting happened to your family. Go into more detail about one of those specific encounters, and we can maybe talk about some of the phrases and and things that the medical profession did that led to that. So pick one of those scenarios and just tell us that story. So we'll just use my mom, for example, she's been, well, she had been having ongoing chronic headaches and they were just so intense. They were happening every day. They were getting worse and worse. She went to a primary care physician. At first, the primary care physician is just like, just take some over the counter medicine. And she's like, I am. And she's like, well, just take some more. And then she's like, okay, you know, call me if things don't improve. So things don't improve. She goes back and the primary care physician was like, okay, we'll go ahead and use the prescription that you have that could potentially help these headaches and just take more of it. And again, her situation wasn't getting any improvement. And I think it was after the third primary care physician appointment that she got the referral for a neurologist. So I went with her to the neurology appointment And, you know, he did a clinical exam, you know, I'm going to give you a series of words. I want you to repeat these words back to me, follow my finger, the whole gamut. But I was sitting there getting the impression that he was just kind of blowing her off and just saying, you know, these headaches are just something that you're going to have to deal with. And for me, I thought it was very presumptuous of him to assume that without having any concrete evidence that this is just some, you know, ridiculous headache syndrome that he tried to diagnose her with. And so he actually said to us, just to give us both a better sense of mind or security or make us feel better, I'll go ahead and order a CT scan for you to give you that peace of mind. And so at that point, it was like he was doing us a favor. 
And sure enough, the um, CT scan results came back with showing the brain tumor as well as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So then we ended up having to call the office because they didn't even call us with the results. We got the results in my chart. So we had to call and say, were you planning on calling my mom to tell her about, you know, her test results? We fired that doctor, obviously. He didn't offer any apologies for his mistakes either. And we went to another neurologist in that same practice, and she tried to just prescribe her some drugs that actually were not supposed to be taken with another prescription she was currently on. So then that tells us, are these doctors even bothering to read the charts? Are they bothering to read the intake paperwork of the patients? So let's say you were to replay that whole scenario in your mind, and this time in your ideal world, how should the doctor have responded, whether it's a primary care physician or the neurologist? In your ideal world, what should have happened instead? I would think this at that point was going to be the fourth appointment for the same ailment and system uh, for symptom. And, you know, the patient, which was my mother, was going to a specialist at this point because all other therapies and all other visits with a primary care physician weren't showing any improvement. So at that point, I would think that the doctor would want to rule out anything serious. And you don't know what you don't know. And that's why I felt there should have been some imaging to prove that it's just headache syndrome. So let's go ahead. I think you might just have headache syndrome, but let's go ahead and do some imaging so we can see if there's anything there that we might be missing, right? So during these encounters that you and your mother had with these, these clinicians, did they give you any input in terms of how you wanted the care directed? Did they simply say, this is what we're going to do? Did they leave any option open to say, we can do A, B, and C, but I wanted your input in terms of how you want to proceed? Yeah, so getting the testing, that really wasn't, you know, kind of like any input, like how we want to proceed. It was just like, here, I'll go ahead and order you that CT scan for, you know, better peace of mind. I think subconsciously, he probably thought maybe there wasn't any sort of growth or, or tumor present that was causing her symptoms. The second doctor that we went to the in, in the same practice, but just a different location, she just made it seem like we're just going to try and make the patient, you know, less symptomatic. We're going to just try and make you feel, you know, better and alleviate with what you're going through by like two or three different types of prescriptions. So that was kind of like her plan at that point. The, the growth that they did find within the brain, they were just going to monitor that, you know, obviously they don't go in and remove things unless they absolutely have to, or they're, you know, very, very dangerous for the patient to, to leave that there. So they were going to monitor that. So. Now, you described several episodes where you and your family had negative encounters with the healthcare system. Was it simply bad luck, just a run of bad doctors, or do you think that there was something more going on behind the scenes that led them to what they said and the decisions they made? And I know you're just speculating here, but why do you think they reacted that way? I'm going to use kind of just more like in general. You know, why are maybe patients experiencing medical gaslighting in today's modern healthcare system? And, you know, really who is to blame? And that's really what the article kind of emphasized. You know, is it, is it the patient? Do we need to blame the patient? When it comes to the patient, they need to be as forthright and as detailed and honest with their doctors as possible, because what they're not telling their doctor isn't going to enable the doctor to really know what they need to order or to be able to give a diagnosis or treatment. But then when we look at the doctor, is the doctor open-minded? Is the doctor listening to the patient? Is the doctor believing the patient? Is the doctor doing everything that they possibly can on their end to get a diagnosis and an effective treatment plan? But when we have the pressure from these medical networks on the doctors, you know, see as many patients as you possibly can in a short window of time. I think, you know, maybe the average might be like 15 minutes now. You can't accomplish much in 15 minutes. You're trying to build a relationship with this patient in 15 minutes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you can accomplish in that amount of time. So 
do we have the pressure from the medical networks on to our healthcare system? And if we're not giving all of the patients the time that they deserve and need, are we really going to get the answers that we need and the treatment that we need at the end of the day? But then we have insurance companies. You know, are they having these loopholes that everyone has to go through in order to get things done and make things happen? Maybe in the back of a healthcare professional's mind, maybe they're a little bit nervous about ordering XYZ tests. Maybe they'll order all the tests in the world and everything will come back, you know, completely normal. And then is the insurance company going to look at this doctor like, what are you doing? So I think accumulatively, when we look at everything, I think everyone needs to kind of be in unison together. Everyone needs to kind of work together as a team. The, doc the patient needs to be honest and open. The doctor needs to do their due diligence and really truly listen and believe their patient. The medical networks need to take a step back and focus more on healthcare so that we can avoid more medical gaslighting in the future. And the insurance companies, they're there for a reason. You know, we need to be able to provide the tests that our patients need. So what kind of advice do you have specifically for clinicians? Because you have an audience of clinicians who listen to this podcast. Sometimes they want to push back on 50 minutes per patient too. If I had my choice, I would spend at least an hour with each patient. But if we're unable to push back against those time constraints, in the exam room, what kind of advice do you have for us physicians to be more open-minded, to listen to patients? Give us some specific examples of positive examples of that. Yeah, you know, luckily I had an amazing surgical breast oncologist who was able to take the time with me and listen to me and be open-minded to my research because if it wasn't for her, my outcome would have been entirely different. But I think that more healthcare professionals just need to stand up to these healthcare networks. Listen, we can't accomplish much in 15 minutes. We could be looking at potential lawsuits. I could be looking at losing my medical license. I mean, there's a huge risk here for only giving a small window of opportunity for these patients. I mean, truly, you can't really accomplish much in, in 15 minutes. And you know, maybe the patient hasn't been there in two years. There's a, a lot that could have happened in a two-year time frame. And, you know, even my own surgical breast oncologist wrote in my book that she didn't have the time to devote to the research that I did to get the answers. And at the end of the day, it shouldn't be the patient's responsibility. It should be the doctor's responsibility to do the research, to find out what needs to be done and to do it. And there shouldn't be any roadblocks. Now, let's ask that question from the patient's standpoint, what are some ways that they can better advocate for themselves sometimes in that rush environment like you described? Yeah be prepared, right? Do as much as you can to learn about what potentially you're dealing with, or if you've been given a diagnosis, learn, a, learn as much as you can ahead of time. Come with a list of questions that you would like to ask. Maybe bring someone with you who can take notes and just advocate for yourself. You, if you feel something is not right, it probably isn't. We were all born with an intuition, use it. <laughs> We're talking to Tammy Burdick. She's a patient advocate and she's the author of the book, Diagnosis Detective, Curing Granulomatosis Mastitis. Her Kevin MD article is titled Medical Gaslighting, A Growing Challenge in Today's Medical Landscape. Tammy, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Yeah. If anyone in healthcare or patients or the medical networks or the insurance company is listening, let's just all work together in unison as a team. And hopefully, moving forward, we will see less medical gaslighting and more happy people in general. Tammy, thanks again for coming on the show, sharing your story, time, and insight.